So let's look at a node in more detail. Here we have two major components, the kubelet and the cube proxy. The cube proxy allows network traffic to come in and then be redirected into one of the various pods. And here are three separate pods that might be accepting that network traffic. And notice too that it's inside of these pods that you will find your containers. And the container engine is what is running all of these containers. So in the case of most uh, deployments that we'll be working with, that would be Docker. And indeed, you can see Docker running here as the engine. Now the kubelet is actually an agent, and its job is to communicate back to the master. And so you're going to have a kubelet in every node. Now, if a pod goes down, it's the kubelet's job to communicate that back to the master. But the kubelet itself won't start the pod. The master would do that. Now, that work is exposed as what's called an endpoint, and that happens on TCP port 10.255. Now, just to be clear, if there's a pod running a web page, it is the cube proxy that allows network traffic into and out of that web page. It is not the kubelet, which is really, again, just the agent, so that's the communication between the nodes and the masters. Now, if your pod has more than one container, like you're seeing here, then the IP address of that first container is the same IP address as the second container, and the memory that the container one has is the same memory as the container two has, and the same applies for volumes as well. And we saw this before because of the, well, there are of course C groups, but mostly the kernel namespace is providing that division between the two, and then the, the C groups will divvy out how often you know these things get access to the entire host. And of course, it's the union-capable file systems helping us with our volumes. And that also means that if container 1 needs to talk to container 2, it can use localhost to do that. So what would a pod look like that runs multiple containers? Well, if you remember that Docker can get into or open up a bash command using docker exec ti, so can kubectl, which is the main administrative command to get into the control plane. And by the way, that happens over these REST calls. This is going to issue POST commands and other REST calls. So if I hit enter here, you're going to get an error. And the reason is because the namespace by default is default. You have to provide the specific namespace to get in there. And it's complaining because it wants to know, well, which container? Well, if you remember, there is an inspect command in Docker to give you details about a given container. kubectl has a describe equivalent. So if I copy and paste that command, and we'll pipe that into less, don't forget to give it the namespace. And if you scroll down, you'll see container and container ID along with images. So why don't we grep for a container? We'll give it a dash B for before, one line before each container mention. And there we go, we have three different containers and that's what they are. Now, if we add a dash A for after and give it a one, we're going to see a list of images. And that's because this is still Docker, and Docker needs to have access to the images to pull them down. This could be either a private registry, or it could be a public registry like Docker Hub. Also notice that these two are connected by supervisor D, which provides liveness monitor, what is a live, and also it allows you to monitor and control a number of processes on Unix-like systems. And that is an overview of the Kubernetes system as a cluster.